Okay, continuing on in GI, let's talk about cleft lips and palates. Uh, the face, remember, in utero, it kind of grows from the side and merges together then at the center, at the midline. The lip, that should happen between seven eight to eight weeks of gestation, and then the palate should fuse between seven and 12 weeks. Um, when a child's born with a cleft lip, the lip is what the parents really see. And it can look very abnormal and even almost gruesome. So uh, it's pretty emotional and difficult for a parent to see this child they've been anticipating who does not look very human or very normal. Um, we do wonderful jobs repairing these nowadays. The amount of scar that's left is just minimal. Um, the cleft palate, even though it doesn't look as bad to the parent, that really is the one that causes a lot of problems. It causes a lot of feeding problems. <clears throat> they can't get a good um, around the nipple well to suck with the, the lip or the palate, but the palate, when they do get try and um, squeeze the nipple between the tongue and the roof of the mouth, there's no roof of the mouth there to squeeze it again. So it, a lot of feeding problems. When we do put formula into the mouth, that tongue kind of pushes up and pushes it right up into the nose, and you'll see it bubble out their nose. So surgical repair, they'll usually do the lip between 6 and 12 weeks, and then the palate, they need to wait until the child's grown a little more, and that'll be between 12 and 18 months. Now, these are delicate surgeries. Um, like I said, they do a beautiful repair anymore. There's little to no scarring, but if the child pulls on it, it will, you know, you won't get the nice results. Um, so we put elbow restraints on them. They can still use their hands, they can still move their arms, but they can't bend the elbows. And we don't want them putting anything in their mouth either. Your book has a picture of a Logan's bow. This is not something I've seen used at the hospital here, but it's another another way to protect that and also um, to prevent stretching and tension on the, the sutures. This does take multiple surgeries to reconstruct it. So when we feed a baby who's got a cleft lip or palate, we want to sit them upright. We don't want them um, laying back. And this ESSR, enlarged nipple, stimulate their suck, make sure they swallow, and allow them rest. We still want to give these kids sucking time. They need that for the muscle development of the jaws and the face, and babies just need to suck. They have a need for sucking. These kids are going to swallow a lot of air though, so frequent burping is important. And you know they may not be able to drink even with the enlarged nipple, they may not be able to get enough from a bottle. At Children's, they have some bottles where the bottle is squeezable, and you can actually, as they make the sucking motion, you're squeezing the bottle. You're basically squirting the formula in their mouth. Sometimes it works better to syringe feed them, because you can get it back farther behind the palate, so you don't have so much problem with them pushing it up uh, into the nose. Um, or sometimes spoon feeding or thickening the formula so that it's a little easier um, for them to swallow. Here's some pictures of how the face should develop, the palate and the lips. That's in utero. And then here's some variations of cleft lips and palates. And here's how a baby looks when they're born. And you can see that's pretty uh, scary looking to the, the parent. Here's the Logan's bow, which prevents pressure from tugging on that suture line and he's got elbow restraints on. The ones we have aren't quite that big around. They look more like um, long popsicle sticks sewn into fabric and then you wrap it around and tie them on. Okay, esophageal atresia and with a, a tracheoesophageal fistula. The things you're going to see with the tracheal esophageal fistula, coughing, choking, cyanosis. This is why we want to watch these kids on their first feeding after they're born. You should have, this should have, uh, you know, talking about watching the first feeding would have been part of OB last semester. If we do find that they have esophageal atresia, they're going to be NPO. 
We are not going to feed them. We're going to give them IV fluids for hydration. We are going to have to suction them, position them to prevent aspirations because they are at high risk for that aspiration and aspiration pneumonia, and so we'll be giving them antibiotics because we are expecting um, some aspiration pneumonia to develop, and this has to be surgically repaired. Um, here's pictures of the most common types. You can see atresia means it didn't develop. So we've got this first one there. You see the, the trachea, which then just it's kind of cutting it off, it's not showing you that, leads down to the lungs and the esophagus ends and the top of the stomach ends. Those should be connected, but they're not. So anything the baby eats in comes right back up. The second picture, you see there's a fistula between the esophagus and the trachea. So whatever that child eats goes into the lungs. Um, then the, the third one the esophagus doesn't connect to anything and the stomach connects to the trachea. So all that stomach content, if they reflex it all, that goes right straight to the lungs. Or you can get a connection, um, there's a fistula there, but there's still some connection between the, the top of the esophagus and the bottom of it, but it connects to the trachea. And then the last one, there's just a fistula between, but they both uh, basically um, are formed correctly, just there's a, a fistula between the two. So you can see why this is, you know, a problem without surgical correction. Here's the most common one is where the, uh, the esophagus just ends and the lower esophagus connects in to the trachea. So what are we going to do? Um, probably put in a gastrostomy tube. We want to drain out what's in the stomach, not let it aspirate up and go into the lungs. And we're going to put in some sort of a Salem sump, an NG tube into that esophagus pouch there. Um, because the child's going to be swallowing saliva, secretions, and it's going to be pooling up there. So we need to, to take that out as well. And see, we're keeping this child sitting up too. We don't want them laying down and just putting them at higher risk for aspirating. In rare cases, if there's really not enough esophagus that's formed, they can take a piece of the colon to make an esophagus. Um, and here's kind of a complex picture of how they would do that. Okay, and then on to hernias. There are different types. A diaphragmatic hernia, uh, this child is going to be critically ill. This means intestine slid up through the diaphragm. So usually this happens in utero while the baby's developing. Where one of the lungs should be developing, it's filled with intestines instead. So they don't have, they have decreased um, lung, just lung tissue and lung capacity. You can have an umbilical hernia where a loop of intestine comes out through the umbilical. Uh, this is your, you know, babies who get outies, they'll cry and it'll pop out. It usually will close by itself as those muscles get bigger and stronger by about one to two years of age. Um, this is the, usually it's the viscera of um, protr it, a protrusion of the viscera into the base of the umbilical cord. Um, I have some pictures of this. That'll make a little more sense then. So it's a covered sac, but there's peritoneum that's coming out. And then gastroschisis. This is where uh, the whole intra-abdominal contents develop outside the wall of the, the abdomen. And here's pictures, you can see this is the diaphragmatic hernia, so where the lung should have been developing, there's intestine. So uh, this is, these children are pretty acutely ill with a lot of, well, they just can't breathe well. 
here's an umbilical hernia intestine slips out between those muscles at the umbilicus uh, usually this is not a big deal as long as it's soft and it's reducible which means it can be pushed back into place as those muscles strengthen it it should quit being a problem here's gastroschisis so all the internal uh, GI developed outside of the abdomen. This, uh, you can't just stick it back in right after birth. And I think that, here's the next picture. If you just stuffed it back in, there isn't enough space. You'd compress the blood vessels, you'd decrease the blood circulation, you'd end up with necrotic internal organs. So we have to let it go back in slowly, but we also want to keep it sterile. So that's why it's put into this pouch and kind of slowly eased back in. Oh, I thought I had a picture of um, if you, the um, ophthalmoseal, you have a little bit. It's not a full gastroschisis. Not everything is outside, just a loop of intestine, but that develops outside without skin over it. Uh, now, pyloric stenosis. This is hypertrophy of the pyloric sphincter. So the pyloric sphincter is thickened and it obstructs the gastric outlet. That's at the base of your stomach, between the stomach and the duodenum. So these kids, they eat because they're hungry, but then they get projectile vomiting. And by projectile, I mean projectile. It will hit the wall behind, you know, mom sets them up to burp them and it comes flying out and hits the wall behind her. They get dehydrated because nothing's going through. They get metabolic acid alkalosis um, and they get failure to thrive. This has to be corrected with pyloromyotomy. So we go in and, and make an opening of that pyloric sphincter. We can begin feedings four to six hours post-op. We're going to start with small amounts and then slowly increase. And we want to restore hydration and electrolyte balance. Here's a picture of the pyloric sphincter and you can see it hypertrophied and pinching off the base of the stomach there. And here's a, another picture. This is what you see. These kids, they look skinny. They have visible peristalsis going on, but they're dehydrated. You can see that doughy uh, poor turgor in their, their skin. Intussusception. This happens most often on kids between three months old and five years old, and this is a telescoping of the intestine. So one part slides inside another part. It usually happens at that ileocecal valve. That's you know where our small and large intestine um, join together. These kids will look very colicky. They're in abdominal pain. They'll have vomiting, and they'll have current jelly-like stools. Uh, so it's you know red with uh, what looks like small little um, current uh, berries and very mucousy. If the stool's brown, it may have already reduced. The definitive diagnosis, the way we do that, is with, used to be with barium, but um, you can also use the water or air with an enema. And, you know, you put the enema in, and most of the time, not only will it, you know, you're watching the barium on, on x-ray or ultrasound, so you can see the telescoping, but most of the time this is also the treatment. You push that barium in, it pushes the telescoped part back out, and you've not only diagnosed it, but treated it. Sometimes it does have to be surgically uh, reduced, kind of pull the part that slipped in outside, and you know, so it can sometimes be surgical. And here's the picture you can see that part down below, there's your uh, appendix, so we're right at that ileocecal valve 